Hi strangers. So I watched Tar. Surprise. It's a very good movie. It's probably my favorite non-horror picture of the year. Unfortunately, because it is so good, the internet decided to talk about it. And from the moment I picked up on what the movie was about, I was already dreading the discourse. Because this is one of those pictures that, like all truly exemplary era-defining films, the majority of audiences will probably need several years more historical distance and contextual hindsight to really get what it's trying to say, what makes it so stellar. Well, I guess that's not the case anymore because I'm on YouTube now. A few things from the get-go. Yes, Lydia Tarr is a problematic character and that's the point. No, her behavior is not condoned by the text. Yes, she's toxic and abusive and no, she's not meant to be seen as a character worth emulating or lionizing. And of course, Kate Blanchett absolutely nailed it because she's Kate fucking Blanchett. Your mother's very deep. If your tar takes are nothing more than pointing these out, congratulations, you've earned a cookie. Please move on to the cafeteria and let the adults discourse in peace. Disclaimer, I wrote this video very fast and there are several things I'm sure I've worded poorly and not quite as developed in thought as others, so I reserve the right to change my mind on anything said within. I'm legit worried about upsetting some people. Just please remember, I, I don't know you, this isn't personal, I'm just an entertainer, so don't take me too seriously. Tar is a very strange film. It's unmistakably a biopic, yet its subject is a complete fiction. It's like the polar opposite of that weird movie, The Al Yankovic Story, an absurdly fake biopic about a real person, and Tar is an absurdly real biopic about a person that doesn't exist. Like, this movie feels so real. The pandemic, that performance, which was scheduled for last year, had to be canceled. Last year was really hard to be locked up alone with two old ladies like us. This picture rings so goddamn true that after leaving the theater, people actually googled this woman before going straight to Twitter to moralize about her. The weirdest thing about Tar, though, is not that it's a biopic about a made-up person, but something else. Something very strange, something very, very obvious, an aspect of the film that I don't think anyone wants to point out has great significance for fear of you know, social crucifixion, but it's a detail whose implications, if we're courageous enough to truly interrogate them, reveal exactly what this picture is saying, and how it fits so seamlessly into the contemporary zeitgeist. It's strange that Lydia Tarr is a woman. Let me explain. Lydia Tarr is an exceptional, unbridled genius. Capital G. The movie opens with her list of accomplishments. Lydia Tarr is many things. A piano performance graduate at the Curtis Institute, Phi Beta Kappa from Harvard. Tarr began her career with the Cleveland Orchestra, Philadelphia Orchestra, the Chicago Symphony Orchestra, the Boston Symphony Orchestra, until she at last arrived here at our own New York Philharmonic. She is in fact one of only 15 so-called EGOTs. She's become particularly well known for commissioning contemporary work. She founded the Accordion Conducting Fellowship. As if that's not enough, her new book, Tar on Tar. One of my first thoughts was, is this a dark comedy? I couldn't help but see you flinch just a little bit as I was reading your bio. Was it because I forgot some other amazing achievement? Satirical parody or not though, this introduces us to the character as the world knows her. She is singular, she is visionary, and like all people with influence, fame, and power, the cost for her brilliance is her humanity. The reason that her gender is significant in this context is not that women aren't capable of accomplishing such things. It's because women occupying this kind of role in our society is extremely unusual. Thought experiment. Imagine if this movie was exactly the same, unchanged in basically any detail, except that we swap Tar's gender. That's it, the movie is otherwise more or less the same. There's the very fact that we can swap her gender without significantly changing the film, that in itself is telling, but what would this version be like? If Lydia Tar was a man, this would be the most annoying, obnoxious, and plain boring movie of the year. And that's saying something, because this has been the year for shitty biopics. I would have hated it, not because it's a bad movie, but because we've already seen it hundreds of times before. We've known dozens of men who have been idolized as singular visionary geniuses, who have abused their position and influence to prey upon women they have power over, who, when the time has come for them to face the music and deal with the consequences of their actions, are mildly inconvenienced at most, while their reputations and careers remain intact. But unlike Lydia Tarr, these men are real. We've seen their stories, on big screens and small, over and over and over again. My initial reaction to reading the plot summary, I don't like going into movies blind. My first reaction was, bullshit. It surprised me that people were actually convinced that this could be a real person because as someone who remembers well the socio-political climate of the 2010s before and after Me Too, I couldn't buy this story as believable because in reality for the majority of the time that I've been alive, no woman, especially a queer woman, could live the kind of life Lydia Tarr lives and get away with it. Powerful men abuse the vulnerable below them. It's business as usual, and it's dealt with in the way we see in Tar. Right now, it's a reset. What we're after is less, not more. Rebuild this from the ground up, that means we need a new story. 
but a powerful woman, a lesbian at that, she would have been tarred, feathered, and pilloried in the town square, called everything conservatives have to say about queer people, groomer, pedophile, rapist, etc. Merely the accusation, true or otherwise, would destroy a woman like that in the society I was born and raised within. Because the world I'm from loves to see queer people castigated, it loves to see women proving misogynists right by misusing the power they do achieve. But the film Tar is different. It's genuinely strange to me that Lydia Tar's gender and sexuality aren't more of a factor in her social reckoning. At first I reconciled this in my mind by interpreting Tar as, as I said, a dark comedy, using the female character of Lydia Tar to illustrate how absurdly we worship and forgive celebrities for doing terrible shit to people when they're men. The degree to which everyone sucks this woman's dick as a capital G genius is borderline parodic. Her being a woman highlights the absurdity of our obsession with legacy and reputation and our adherence to the mythology of great men. But despite these elements that ring as absurd or satirical, this story is ultimately not a joke because it does feel real. It shouldn't feel believable or even possible, and yet it feels so real and feasible. Countless audiences had to double check that it isn't based on a real person. This does feel like someone who could exist in 2022. And that's the point of Tar. It's something very uncomfortable, something that begs us to question our understanding of gender, power, and creativity as we've spent the last five years cultivating them. Groan all you want, but Tar is a Me Too movie. And I mean that completely non-derogatorily, purely descriptive. Out of the comments, shut up and let me elaborate. To find one thing that Bernstein gave you, what would it be? Kavanaugh. It's, it's the Hebrew word for attention to meaning. Right, Kavanaugh. I think that's a word that will have slightly different meaning for many in our audience. Well, yes. Yes, I imagine so. I was 23 when Me Too started in late 2017. I'd been a woman for two years and I was still learning the ropes, i.e. learning how to consciously exist and move through the world as a visible and easily targeted minority, and unlearning things like toxic masculinity. The fuck this trans women having male privilege or male socialization bullshit, but having to unlearn toxic masculinity is a thing. Trust me. Regardless of your assigned gender at birth, if you exist within the patriarchy, you have been brainwashed by it and need to reprogram yourself. No getting around that. Sorry. So I called Me Too pretty early. Once the f first waves of accusations started piling up, I told my partner at the time, babe, this is gonna be huge. Soon we're gonna be referring to the world in terms of Me Too and post Me Too. And as I predicted with Black Lives Matter in 2014 and the pandemic right after quarantine began, that happened. It's called the Nostradamus method. Learn how to break down and read into every social phenomenon that happens and find an impressive and prophetic way to say, oh shit, this is gonna change the world. You'll be right most of the time. Foolproof. We live in a post Me Too world, and this is the world that Lydia Tarr fits into. Tarr actually kind of reminds me of another post Me Too film from 2020. Very, very polarizing one. One that framed things in a controversial way, a way that upset a lot of people, especially feminists at the time, including me. Promising Young Woman, like Tar, features a morally dubious woman carrying out a crusade of revenge for her friend, a girl who committed suicide after being sexually assaulted and refused justice from the system, courtesy of rape culture, which by 2020 a lot of us had known about for like many years. Her revenge consists of going out and picking up men, pretending to be too drunk to consent to sex, and then when these skeevy guys still try to initiate, she reveals her sobriety to shock and call them out. Because as everyone knows, that's how you teach people about consent and combat rape culture, through entrapment and fear. Spoiler Spoilers for Promising Young Woman, even though knowing what happens ahead of time does not adequately prepare one for the scene itself. Basically, when Homegirl catches the guy in question, she ties him up with the intent of torturing him. He escapes and he kills her. It's one of the most shocking scenes in film history, and the narrative did such a great job of manipulating our feelings of social justice outrage and the eye for an eye philosophy our society overtly and unquestioningly assents to, and then uses that to reveal an uncomfortable reality about rape culture that most of us in 2020 were not ready or willing to accept. Rape culture is not a matter of individuals. It's systemic. It's not something that we can fight fire with fire with. Honestly, I think this film isn't so much a rape revenge story made for an audience of victims of sexual violence as it is a didactic piece intended to illustrate the horror of rape culture for predominantly male audiences who may not have a solid understanding of consent and systemic misogyny. It works very well as an exercise in empathy, forcing its viewers to put themselves in Mulligan's shoes. The devastation of her murder isn't meant for feminists. It's meant for viewers who would normally identify with the man who kills her. See, here's a thing that a lot of people either didn't get or chose to ignore about Promising Young Woman. Like with Lydia Tarr, Mulligan's character is not a good guy. She is not in the right. Her actions, while they do make us feel good and give us that emotional catharsis of righteous revenge, is, correctly, judged by the text, 
to be predatory. She is literally preying on men. She prowls, she finds her prey, she carries out the song and dance to entrap them. And we rooted her on all the way to her murder, which is to be expected. The narrative is deliberately crafted to get us to sympathize with and accept her predatory behavior as just desserts, the patriarchy getting what's coming to it. Rape culture kicked in the balls. All the nice, cathartic things revenge stories encourage us to feel. It's a power fantasy. I feel like a lot of the negative reactions to this movie, I've heard the word anti-feminist more than once, which is categorically just wrong, primarily come from a place of indignation, of taking what the narrative seems to be saying on the outermost surface personally as a condemnation of the righteous anger and valid frustrations viewers have with misogyny and rape culture. There was a lot of assuming that what happens to Mulligan's character is earned, or it proves she was in the wrong to feel the way she was feeling that motivated her, frankly, awful actions, and that the text is judging you, viewer, you personally, for sympathizing with her or relating to her trauma. But here's the thing about engaging with challenging texts. Even if your views are progressive, even if you're a leftist, even if you think you're a good person with moral righteousness on your side, you can still be reactionary. It's not a quality exclusive to conservatives. Conservative and reactionary are not synonymous. Being reactionary is a human quality. It's literally impossible not to have emotional reactions to the world around you. And boy oh boy, Promising Young Woman is written specifically to elicit strong moral reactions. We're supposed to feel this way when Mulligan is killed, but it's not because the text is ideologically attacking us or judging us, it's because the text is challenging us to look closer, to re-examine our perspective and interrogate our reflexive, reactionary moral outrage reflexes. All moral outrage reflexes are reactionary, never forget that. Whether they're valid or not, good morals or bad morals, that outrage we all feel is a reactionary thing. The trick is to move past those defense mechanisms and meet the animal analytical challenge to really understand what the text is trying to communicate by meeting it on its own terms. And if I may throw my current analysis and opinion of that film out there, fuck Carrie Mulligan's character. Like, she didn't deserve to die, and it made me literally sick to actually watch it, but ultimately I have a hard time feeling too bad for her. She did eagerly and unnecessarily put herself in a horribly dangerous situation where she knew and was prepared for the worst to happen, and... You try stalking someone to a cabin in the woods, tying them up, and happily sharing your intent to torture them. Imagine in such a situation that the genders were reversed. You wouldn't call what happens murder, you'd call it self-defense. I hope most of us would. Not to mention the overall point about the ending and what it says about rape culture. He was only punished because he actually killed her. But can you imagine if, for example, he or anyone else in the cabin had only raped her instead of killing her? Not a single one of them would have suffered any consequences. Just like her friend, she only meant anything to the system when she was a corpse. Because that is how misogyny and rape culture work. That's fuck the fuck up. And illustrating that is not anti-feminist. You don't have to like Promising Young Woman. Doesn't reflect on your character in any way, even if you completely disagree with my critical evaluation. I'm just trying to describe patterns in media and society that I've noticed without judgment. And regardless of where you stand on pictures like Promising Young Woman, it's really hard to deny that for the last five years, we've had a very consistent negative reaction to works that challenge our preconceived notions of gender and power. Because that's what Me Too was and has always been about. Gender and power. It's a landmark historical event for the socio-political movement that is 21st century feminism. Me Too was a phenomenon that was the result of several intersecting axes of discourse about both gender and power. It was a revolution, one that has overall made the world a slightly better place. But the liberal girl boss feminism that made our culture think that Hillary Clinton ever had a chance at being president it adapted, it evolved, and like capitalism has always done, it assimilated. Five years later, from what I've seen, feminism has been institutionalized, and it, in the mainstream, it grows more reactionary by the year. It may be an uncomfortable reality to accept, but TERF means trans-exclusionary radical feminist, and their gender fascist ideology is not a deviation of mainstream radical feminism, but the logical conclusion of it. Truth is, J.K. Rowling embodies historical mainstream feminism more accurately than Bell Hooks or Marquise Bay. We're living in a post-gender world. Not post like it's over, but post as in a world where gender still exists, but it's not all there is. It's not an absolute anymore. Patriarchy, or gender hierarchy, is evolving and changing as gender becomes more fluid, unfixed, and subjective. Capitalism, neoliberalism, white supremacy, fascism, these are all adapting to a 
post-pandemic world. 2017 to 2020 was like the peak emergence of white girl boss feminism. And also I think the last time feminism as a word was any sort of practical or meaningful in progressive discourse, but things have changed. They've changed fast and we need to stay awake and pay attention. As Hannah Gasby foreshadowed in 2018. I believe women are just as corruptible by power because you know what fellas? You don't have a monopoly on the human condition, you arrogant fucks. This is what Tar is about. It's not strange that Lydia Tar is a woman. It's strange that her being a woman isn't strange. Because Tar the film understands something that many of us on the left, especially those politically identifying as feminists, really need to figure out. At the end of the day, it isn't about gender. It's about power. Who has power over whom? Who is and isn't held accountable for the harm they cause? Whose use of force and exploitation is deemed legitimate? Whose narratives does society buy? Who's even allowed to have their own narrative? Conservatives, gender fascists, wingers of the right. This is what grooming is. Lydia Tarr is a literal groomer and a predator. But, as the text is abundantly clear, if you know how to fucking read, her identity as a queer woman has nothing to do with it. You know, what about Beethoven? You into him? Because for me, as a U-Haul lesbian, I'm not too sure about old Ludwig. This is the only explicit mention to her sexuality, and she uses it solely as a rhetorical grounds for why a student should be more willing to conduct the work of dead old racists and misogynists as opposed to studying the work of marginalized composers. But then I face him, and I find myself nose to nose with his magnitude. Uh, phrasing? I'm sure she does know what a U-Haul lesbian is, but in context, she seems to be using it much more as a political buzzword. Because the U-Haul qualifier doesn't really seem to make sense in the context of what she's saying, but that's just me. But speaking of context, this scene alone is amazing. This ten and a half minute uninterrupted take contains Tar going off on a student disinterested in the work of dead, problematic white male composers in favor of underrepresented composers that she neither respects nor understands. Like most narcissistic manipulators, Tar talks a lot. 25% of this film is her spouting sophistries to win arguments and take advantage of people. Another 25% is her contradicting everything she said through her words and actions. And the other 50% is subtextual storytelling reinforcing her hypocrisies. In this scene, she essentially mocks the student's identity politics and insists on the necessity of sticking to canon, in spite of how problematic and white and male it is, at the expense of this marginalized student's identity as a non-white, gender non-conforming person, of course. It's funny considering how this rant is situated between her insistence that to understand Mahler's fifth, one must understand his personal relationships outside of his art. The five is a mystery, and the only clue he leaves us is the dedication to his new wife, Alma. The first thing you must do is try to understand that very complex marriage. And her dismissal of Francesca's point about how Mahler sabotaged his wife Alma's creative career robbing her of her place in the canon that Tar thinks so highly of. Alma was a composer too, but he insisted she stop writing music. He said there was only room for one, one asshole one in the house. She agreed to those rules. No one made that decision for her. Hashtag rules of the game. Ultimately, whatever points Lydia Tar may make, however valid some of her takes may be, her words are utterly bereft of any meaning or sincerity. One of the funniest parts of the film is the way the other students haphazardly mishmashed footage of her tirade together to strip away its nuances to reveal the problematic rhetorical and situational subtext of what's going on here. You must be a Negro product exploited by the Jews. Now let's turn our gaze back to the piano bench up there to a super hot young woman. This is very good. Now, you can masturbate, but what are you actually doing? To me. This video is one of the parts of the movie that made me laugh. But while it's true that she is being a hypocritical, problematic cunt with how she phrases and frames things, if we take her argument at face value, in good faith, the kernel of what she's trying to say isn't wrong. Now is the time to conduct music that actually requires something of you. Music that everybody knows but will hear differently when you interpret it for them. Can classical music written by a bunch of straight Austro-German church-going white guys exalt us? And who, may I ask, gets to decide that? She's the voice of the establishment, and she's vocalizing something very, very true about the establishment. They don't actually want marginalized, creative voices. 
They don't want diversity. They want the appearance of it. They want minority faces and bodies while hearing the same music they've always heard. Sure, you can play and promote the work of obscure, forgotten, marginalized artists, but the establishment will only ever let you be a token for it. A cute novelty that ticks off enough diversity boxes to avoid public criticism. But if you want to be one of the greats, if you want to be a capital G genius, if you want to be Lydia fucking Tar, you must play the music and tell the stories that the white, patriarchal, neoliberal establishment wants to hear. What's your name is Alexander Hamilton? <laughs> How'd that get in there? Don't worry, we will talk about Hamilton another day. It's fucked up and it shouldn't be like that, but that's the reality of the machine. If you want to have value, then you must give those in power what they want. But while the video erases this nuance and the point she's trying to make, the fragments it does capture strip away her veiled, distracting rhetoric to reveal the nature of her inappropriate behavior towards and treatment of this student. Lydia Tarr acts not only as a voice of power in this room, but as the physical presence of power. That is to say, oh my god, this person's leg tapping is stressing me out. If anyone watching has difficulty reading body language, this person is very uncomfortable. The dynamic here is clear. They're scared of her. Her reputation precedes her. And this isn't just a power dynamic of teacher and student. No, 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 no. There's Tar's status and celebrity, which automatically swings the scales in her favor. There's the fact that she's a rich white woman facing down a BIPOC pangender person and using her authority to invalidate their feelings and experiences. And most telling, there's the way she physically engages with the student, despite them very clearly non-verbally expressing their discomfort around her. These may not read to some of y'all as a big deal. Yeah, maybe she made someone a little uncomfortable, but that's not the same as like the worst things she's done. But watching the rest of the film and analyzing all the text and subtext were given, her behavior in this scene is not an anomaly. This is what she does. Everyone knows about her. They don't say anything, of course, cause she's Lydia fucking Tar. I'm sure I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, please. Just because nobody dares breathe it. We know the things you do, the little favors you grant. I really don't know what to say. You, of all people, have the temerity to question my integrity. No, no, I, 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 I'm sorry, Maestro. I don't, I don't know what I'm saying. No, 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 I it's clear just... you know exactly what you're saying. No, don't mind it. That's just Harvey. That's just Lydia. That's what she does. And her behavior with this student illustrates perhaps the most important thing about Tar and her abuses of power. Her lesbianism? has nothing to do with it. But that's the point. The point that right-wingers who like to conflate queerness with predation and call queer people groomers need to get through their stupid fucking heads. It's not about gender. It's about power. And also, in light of recent events, uh, I just want to say, y'all, the ones preying on your children are not the homosexuals or the transgenders. The ones preying on children, the ones you should be directing your vitriol and bullets at, are the ones who have power over children. Priests, police, politicians, celebrities, those relatives that everyone knows about but no one says anything. Also, with regard to Lydia Tarr, there are volumes to be written on how much her power is entwined with and enabled by her whiteness. It's significant that it's a non-white student she bullies. And then there's the her whole fucking eat, pray, love, spirit quest bullshit about appropriating the philosophies of an indigenous culture to escape from taking responsibility for herself. My ethnographic field work in the Amazon, the Shipibo Kanibo only receive a song if the singer is there. In that way, the past and the present converge. That definition of fidelity makes sense to me. Lenny, he believed in Teshuvah, the Talmudic power to reach back into time and, and transform the significance of one's past deeds. There's a lot to be said about Tar's white bullshit but that's not really my area to talk on, and I'm afraid this video is already, get, already getting longer than I wanted it to be, so let's just leave it at. Lydia Tart is uncomfortably believable as a gay female public figure in 2022, and the film would work eerily well if you swapped her gender, but there is no way in fuck this movie would work if Lydia Tar was a black woman. Yes, the patriarchy is still a thing. Yes, power in our society is significantly stratified by gender. I'm not trying to say that's not the case. I'm simply trying to point out that gender is, at the end of the day, subjective and fluid, and power is learning to adapt to that. And we cannot let that escape our attention, because it's already happening. We must continue holding powerful men against the coals, yes, obviously, but we can't let our ideological impetus to growth and improvement end with gender. Having a girl boss president or CEO isn't gonna make a goddamn bit of difference with changing the system. Our struggles aren't about gender, they're about power. We can't let powerful white women off the hook, especially the cishet ones. And I hate to say it, but we are kind of doing that. For example, 
director Olivia Wilde's conduct during production of Don't Worry Darling. Everything about that film, honestly. The entire film basically being Wilde's own sexual power fantasy. So regressive it would make Lana Del Rey blush. Starting a super unprofessional relationship with one of her leads. Marketing the film exclusively as a sexually indulgent spectacle. And in the same breath, refusing to hire an intimacy coordinator. All at the expense of Florence Pugh, the rest of the cast and the crew, and the production as a whole. Never even mind the creepiness of the fact that all of the sex in text was non-consensual at best, making the picture's promotion as a feminist celebration of female pleasure kind of uncomfortable? Olivia Wilde's abuses of power feel just as egregious to me as Bertolucci's in Last Tango in Paris, or Hodorowsky's in El Topo, or Paul Verhoeven's in anything. But that's just how I feel. Something worth thinking about. Ooh, another fun and horrifying metatextual layer to tar to mull over. Nice little note to end on to make this text and its subject matter feel even more uncomfortably real. Naomi Merlant, who plays Tar's very much complicit assistant, as well as the, the painter of the portrait of a lady on fire, made her feature directorial debut last year with the fucking terrible white savior rom-drum Mio Vita Mon Amour, written by and starring Merlant and her underage boyfriend she met when he was 16 and she was 31. Actually, there are several white female film directors who have had questionable relationships with young actors and actresses who work for them, but I'm already gonna make enough people upset with enough with this video, so learn and emotionally, intellectually deal with all that shit on your own. Bottom line, power supersedes gender and Tar uses the ever-popular and history-writing biopic genre to show us what the abuses of the powerful look like in our strange, post-feminist, gender-weird contemporary society. And that's why I think it's a text that will be elevated with time and perspective, something that very few biopics can claim. Again, I wrote this very quickly, so I reserve the right to change my mind about anything I say here. And as impotent as I feel the label now is, yes, I am still a feminist. I'm just tired of powerful white women perpetuating the myth of feminism as a game that can be won, a way of assimilating into the gender hierarchy instead of abolishing it. Comment your favorite problematic girl boss, or tell me about an artist you think deserves a biopic more than Lydia fucking Tar. That's all. End of video. Like and subscribe. No gods, no masters. All cops are bastards. Good night, and be strangers.